the expansion of naturalism as a way of explaining things uh, has continued fairly aggressively for four centuries and I think will continue to for, for many more centuries and such that we'll be left with the question is what, what is there left for God to do? Um, and so I think um, just two points on that is that one, although I can't prove a negative, I can demonstrate fairly conclusively, I think, that uh, belief in God and the kind of gods you believe in and the sorts of religions you adhere to depend very much on where you happen to have been born and in which century you happen to have been born. So if you were born 10,000 years ago or, or 200 years ago or, or 500 years from now, uh, is very much going to shape what particular God you, you believe in. And so that alone tells us that there's a strong cultural component and historical component to just the concept of God. And there's nothing particularly unusual about uh, creation myths. All cultures have them. There's nothing, then there's something. Or else it wouldn't be a creation story, would it? <laughs> and, um, and most cultures have flood myths, especially cultures that uh, are on bodies of water that flood. Uh, lots of cultures have um, uh, resurrection stories and virgin birth stories. Dionysus, a Greek uh, god of wine, uh, uh, converted water into wine, drank the, the uh, body and blood of, of, the, of the creator of the universe. And, and, uh, and, and Osiris, the Egyptian god, way predating Judeo-Christian gods, uh, had a kind of a resurrection and savior stories such that first if the pharaoh believes in Osiris he, he gets everlasting life then the pharaohs figured out it you can employ people to build pyramids much better if you give them the promise of the afterlife also and that expanded into basically accepting a savior type person uh, to achieve everlasting life so we see that happening so the, uh, uh, everywhere we go and then the second point uh, just to wrap it up is that uh, the, what we know from neuroscience is that uh, we do tend to uh, look at the world and find meaningful patterns and and impose on those patterns intentional agency and so the intentional agents are things like ghosts and gods and demons and angels and aliens and so forth and and God is another version of that it's a projection of what our brain is doing to try to understand and make sense of the world and all of that together I think is a strong several lines of evidence to show us that we created God and not vice versa thank you Michael Deepak I just want to correct a few inaccuracies I have met Michael before but it was in a previous lifetime <laughs> okay. uh, Secondly, I also want to reinforce that we, along with what Michael said, that I'm not here to talk about belief. I think belief is a cover-up of insecurity. You only believe in things that you don't know the truth of and you want to know the truth of. If I asked you, do you believe in electricity or electromagnetism, you would say, what kind of a ridiculous question is that? If you want to know the truth, you must have the experience, you must have a theoretical basis, and you must have the rules of science to either falsify what you're saying, that means experimentally prove it, or at least submit to what is called Occam's principle, the theory of parsimony, that the simplest explanations are the best explanations. So I'm not here to defend the god of primitive theology which uh, Michael Shermer has talked about. I'm not here to defend Osiris, although Gene can speak to that. I'm not here to defend Dionysus, although when he was speaking, I had the feeling that I was Dionysus once, uh, and because, because I'm a reformed uh, wine lover. Uh, now, here's the gist of what I want to say today. We are here not to argue the validity of science. Science is the most impeccable way of understanding the rules, the laws of nature. A science that has brought us the rules of mathematics, physics, chemistry, cosmology, evolution. So we're not going to argue about that. It's irrelevant. What we're going to say is that we are here to upgrade science so that we can look at a deeper level of reality where we find an infinite intelligence, an infinite consciousness that explains to some extent the Big Bang, cosmogenesis, what is called autopoiesis, which is the, uh, which is the formation of life from inanimate matter, and Darwinian evolution, which is about gene variation and natural selection. 
We are here to see how that very science can upgrade our view of theology, which is why we are calling this the future of God, an upgrading both of science and of theology that looks at God as an infinite consciousness, that good looks at God as the agent of downward causation, that looks at God as the author of the Big Bang, and the first 43, to the first 10 to the power of minus 43 seconds of creation, which is 10 followed by a mil, 10 followed by a tenth of a million, 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 million seconds, of which science has to say that this this segment of creation is not only unknown but unknowable because the laws of physics fail there. They disintegrate. There are no laws to speak of. And once that phase is over, 10 to the power of minus 43, then we have actually very reasonable principles of mathematics, of physics, that explain how primordial gases turn into heavy elements, and how there was the birth of carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen, and how the exact constants of creation. There are about 20 mathematical constants that are arbitrarily assigned to the laws of physics. They have no reason to be there. They're arbitrarily given, but once they are there, you can explain all of cosmogenesis. No one knows how life came from inanimate matter, Maybe one day they'll know, but once it came, then the principles of evolution apply. We're at three minutes. Done. Okay. Well, I think as you've begun to hear, there are two very different kinds of conversations we could have here. We can talk about religion as it is, for most people most of the time, and we can talk about what religion could be or should be, or perhaps what it is for the tiniest minority of people. And... I just want you to be aware of the difference there, because it, it could get lost. Uh, it's true that some people define God as pure consciousness, or as being synonymous with the laws of nature. Uh, but if we talk about consciousness and the laws of nature, we won't be talking about the God that most of our neighbors believe in, which is a personal God who hears our prayers and occasionally answers them. So I just want you to be sensitive to this, because you know, if Michael or I say something derogatory about Islam or Christianity, which seems possible, <laughs> uh, the, the response from the other side shouldn't mention quantum mechanics. And, and, it, and it shouldn't reference a, a, a notion of God that is so denuded of doctrine as to more or less be synonymous with pure mystery or pure information or pure energy or pure anything. Uh, so I just want to, I wanted to plant a flag there where you all can see it, because, because the God that our neighbors believe in is essentially an invisible person. He is a creator deity who created the universe to have a relationship with one species of primate. Lucky us. <laughs> and and he, he's, got, he's got galaxy upon galaxy to attend to, but he's especially concerned with what we do, and, and he's especially concerned with what we do while naked. <laughs> and he, he almost certainly disapproves of homosexuality, and he's created this, this cosmos as a vast laboratory in which to test our powers of credulity. And the test is this. Can you believe in this God on bad evidence, which is to say on faith? And, and if you can, you will win an eternity of happiness after you die. And it's precisely this sort of God and this sort of scheme that you must believe in if you're going to have a, a, any kind of future in politics in this country, a, no matter what's your gifts. I mean, you could be, you could be an, an unprecedented genius. You could look like George Clooney, you could have a billion dollars, and you could have the social skills of Oprah, and you are going nowhere in politics in this country unless you believe in that sort of God. So we can talk about anything we want. I'm happy to talk about consciousness. But please notice that when, when we migrate away from the God that is really shaping human events, 
uh, or the God talk that is really shaping human events in our world at this moment. Gene? Well, you know, as I'm listening to this, and I'm very much aware of the, the variety of stories that are in our midst, and I'm just thinking, I began to think about an old uh, Aboriginal woman who I met in, right in the center of Australia, and I happened to ask her, I said, Maisie, how do we humans differ from wallaby and kangaroo and koala bird? And she said to me, I might. We're the ones who can tell the stories about all the others, which I thought was one of the best definitions of humanity I'd ever heard. So we're going to hear a lot of stories here, and I'd like to um, give you some idea of where I'm coming from with a particular story that is the single most important story of my life. Uh, when I was five years old, I was sent to Catholic school, and um, <clears throat> my father, the comedy writer who was writing for Bob Hope at the time, used to help me along by giving me interesting questions to ask the priests and nuns in the morning. <laughs> like when Jesus rose, was that because God filled him full of helium? Or the one that really occurred to me, uh, when Jesus rose, Sister Teresa, no, Sister Teresa, um, did Jesus ever have to go to the bathroom? Well, that did it. And she got furious at me. She lisped very badly and she said, blasphemy, blasphemy, sacrilege and blasphemy. And for each question she gave me often a million years in purgatory. And at the end of the first grade, I had 300 million years in purgatory to my credit. Well, I went home and my father thought it was hilarious. This had happened. He said, ah, oh, you think you got problems, kid? Wait till you see what they did to a real saint. Wait till you see how they hog-tied poor old Bernadette. And he took me to this great movie playing at the time called The Song of Bernadette. And when I saw the Virgin Mary appear in the grotto, I thought, boy, that's for me. And I ran home and we had a closet where the dog had just had nine puppies and I pushed them away and I got down and I crossed myself and I said, Virgin Mary, please show up in the closet. I'll give up candy for a week, two weeks, okay? Now you be there, okay, I'll count to 10. And I kept counting to higher numbers and giving up, you know, chicken with garlic sauce and stuffed artichokes and, but she never showed up. And then I heard my father enter laughing. He was always laughing. And immediately this whole universe began to laugh. <laughs> and years later, when I could read Dante in the original, the great lines, del riso del universo, the joy that spins the universe, this great symphony of interrelation, of meaning, of goodness, of laughter, and of science. There was some aspect even to my six-year-old mind. Myth, cosmology, science, spirituality, health, education, it was all there. It was all part of a dynamic relationship. And this is what I have sought in my work with cultures and people all over the world. Goodness, meaning, relationship, science, art, and laughter. Gene, thank you. Um, well, <laughs> let me start with you, Deepak. What scientific proof or evidence of any sort can you muster to support your assertion that there is, for lack of a better term, God or some sort of intelligence at the heart of the universe? Before I answer that, I think I want to say something, um, address something that Sam Harris said. He said, God is very concerned about what we're doing naked. Well, what we're doing naked is the very mechanics of creation. So we don't have to be embarrassed sometimes. about. Uh, sometimes, <laughs> at least now, yes, sometimes. Okay, what scientific proof? I think science is, and again, in deference to Sam Harris, he said, don't go the way of quantum physics. I think I'm going to have to say that science is now in a process of overthrowing the climactic overthrow of the superstition of materialism. That everything that we call matter comes from something that is not material that the essential nature of the physical world is that it's not physical, that the essential stuff of the universe is non-stuff, call it what you will. And science also tells us, and if there are any scientists who want to disagree with them, please come up during the question and our answer session. Science tells us that nature is a discontinuity, that it's an on-off phenomenon, that there are gaps between every two ons where you find a field of possibilities, a field of pure potentiality. Science doesn't call it God, but what is God if not the immeasurable potential of all that was, all that is, and all that will be. Science also tells us 
that this is a field of non-locality, where everything is correlated with everything else. My uh, adversaries are going to point out, no, no, everything, God is explained by neurology. Well, I hope today, Michael, that you will convert from a skeptic to a neuroskeptic, because <laughs> your science is really frozen in the dungeons of conservatism and in the dungeons of orthodoxy. Today, science tells us that uh, the essential nature of reality is non-local correlation. Everything is connected to everything else. That there's hidden creativity. There are quantum leaps of creativity. That there's something called the observer effect, where intention orchestrates space-time events, which we then measure as movement and motion and energy and matter. And addressing Sam, we can have a personal relationship with this intelligence because we have a consciousness that is part of the sea of consciousness. Rumi, the great Sufi poet, said, you're not just a drop in the ocean, you're the mighty ocean in the drop. And all you have to do is understand the principles of science and understand that you have within you the resources to intuitively grasp this mystery. But one of the things we have to do today one of the things we have to do today, my friends at Caltech, you have given us this opportunity that you have to stop being the jihadists and the Vatican of conservative and orthodox science, which is not relevant anymore. Did you hear anything in there that convinces you? Um, <laughs> you asked, uh, Dan, what I meant by woo-woo. That is the very embodiment of woo-woo. He said, stringing together at, ra at a rapid patter of a bunch of scientific sounding words sprinkled in with some spiritual new age words is, doesn't mean anything. I hope that uh, hang on, uh, scientists hang on, here in this audience. Yes. And, and by the way, come. scientists are not jihadists here. This is Caltech. We're not jihadists. That was really very unspiritual of you, very un Deepak of you. To say that. Well, you bring out the worst of me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you need to meditate a little bit there. Uh, <laughs> I mean, just take just one, one, one example of this non local quantum effects, we're all connected. No, this is not true. When quantum physicists talk about non locality and the interconnectedness of things, they're talking about things at the quantum level. Wait, well, hold, let me just stop you for a second. Yeah. Because I, I will play the dummy tonight because it's not a hard role for me to assume. Uh, what does non-local mean? What, I don't, I mean, I kind of understand what quantum physics means, but just give it to me really simple. Okay. There's this very simple two-slit experiment where you fire these photons through, and uh, if, if you just have two streams of light, they form a, a, a little interference wave pattern, like throwing two rocks in a You've pond. already confused. Okay. And, <laughs> and so it, Michael, yeah, you want to, interrupt. he's yeah. getting into the woo-woo now. No, no, this is just, you <laughs> Okay, non, He's non what he to means by non, guys with woo -woo. what he means by non-local, what he means by non-local is that everything in the universe is interconnected, and it, it just is not true. It, it just isn't. And and there's no reason to think that it's active at the level of the brain. That non-locality is a principle that is working. But hold on, Deepak, you, you spoke for quite some time. The, the deeper point to make here, and, and what but is? But I want to address that okay. brain thing that but, you just said. Okay. Let's, let's no, just no, let no, finish. You, you might not have to because. The deeper point here, and this is where the whole style and content of what you're saying is so deeply unscientific, is that there's not a, there's not a physicist sitting on this stage right now. Okay, I would never be tempted to lecture a room full of a thousand people at Caltech about physics. I'm not a physicist. You're not a physicist. And, and, and basically every sentence demonstrates that, that you speak on the subject. Now. Now, and, and, and it, please, please don't take this as ad hominem. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm talking about specifically what you said. But the fact, what, what you do and what many people who try to invoke spooky physics do in, in the service of, of propping up their religious and, and new age intuitions, is that they, they think that because, because what you're saying, because, what, because quantum mechanics is, is spooky and difficult to understand, and because what you're saying is spooky and difficult to understand, they must somehow be related, or they must somehow be mutually supportive. 
And that's just fundamentally not true. They are arrived at by completely different methodologies and ways of thinking and criteria of, of discursive evidence. Uh, what, you, what a mystic, you know, I've studied with great mystics. I've met great meditation masters who've spent 20 years in caves perfecting the kinds of techniques of meditation that you would, you would adopt or recommend. Um, they don't know a damn thing about physics. And they're not interested, for the most part, in physics. I mean, there's nothing about sitting in a cave and, and granted, having incredibly useful and, and even normative experiences and transforming your way of life and transforming your moment-to-moment -moment perception of the world. There's nothing about that project that makes you a, a theoretical physicist. Uh, and so these are completely different language games. They're completely, and you have just uh, merge them together in a very unprincipled way and you're getting away well, with it. No, no. I take resentment at your questioning my scientific credentials. In fact, if anyone on this stage is more scientifically credentialed, it's me. I took physics, chemistry, biology. I'm an MD. I'm a neuroendocrinologist. And I want to object We've to your saying that the brain does not biology. obey non-locality. You know, when you right now, when you're thinking right now, uh, 100 trillion neurons are phase locking and frequency locking simultaneously. Is that non-locality okay, no, non or not? Okay, I, can, I, can I just stop for one second? Because Jean has a look on her face like well, she has I, something <laughs> she wants to say, and I want to hear it. Since we have so many human beings, I think, in the audience, um, I, I'd like to just address the human question of this. Please. And also, since you mentioned mystics, and I'm, I'm very gratified that you've you know, spent so much time studying mysticism, and mist is not something, mysticism is not something that begins in mist and ends in schisms, you know, it's, it's better than that. Um, when you really look at what some of the mystics themselves, and I mean the old ones, have said about just this issue, the brain, mind, body question, you can really do no better than Francis of Assisi, who said words to the effect that the, what we're looking for is who is looking. And that seems to address who is it that is the looking. And then a hundred years later, you have Meister Eckhart, who said, uh, the eye by which I see God is the same eye by which God sees me. So already they were caught up in that fascinating conundrum. I personally believe that the selfing game, the selfing game is something that infinity does for fun, you know, and that the paradox of being human, whether you talk about non-dual and, and or singular, the paradox of being human is that we are finite, and we are also the infinite. We are the, you know, we inhabit the universe and the universe inhabits us. Part of my work is to take depth soundings of the human mind body and find out what is there beneath the sensory physical, the psychological, the mythic and symbolic. And ultimately that what appears to be, because I've made a lot of studies of very deep creative thinkers, what is at the source of this immense creativity. We cannot say that the brain secretes thought the way the liver secretes bile, the way David Hume says. Something else much more complex, far more interesting, and involving the ecology of the universe itself is part of this whole creative process. Is what you're saying an assumption, an intuition, or is there any proof to support it? Well, there's a lot of proof if you look at a lot of the work that's being done in the studies of human consciousness. I believe that, but that's a whole different... Can I, can I just... I just want to quote from Einstein, science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind. From Stephen Hawking, it would be very difficult to explain why the universe would have begun in just this way, except as the act of a god who intended to create beings like us. But Hawking's please, an atheist. Please using look this up This is a direct quotes. quote. I, I, so what? He, say, he has stated, Hawking has stated on this very stage, he does not believe in God. Well, he doesn't kind of believe in the dead white male that you're talking about, the straw man that you have put up, or the, or the mythical God that Sam Harris is talking about. The guy about. you put up is a meaningless, non-local God. No, I mean? just said, this is also the God that gives us inspiration, insight, creativity, free will, conscious choice making, imagination. Are your neurons doing that or are you doing that? It's just a, a, a point of process here. Well, could you then just, you're could you dial it down just a, a little bit? Um, first of all, I invite everyone to look up that Einstein quote in Ideas and Opinions. Read it in context. It'll be absolutely obvious. It doesn't, it can't be pressed into the service that you just witnessed. 
Um, Einstein complained about this treatment of, of his, his metaphorical use of the word God and, and, and his, the few things he said about religion. Uh, and you can look that up in, in Richard Dawkins' book. Um, this is a game. Uh, and it's a game that is, that is designed for export to people who don't know much science and don't know how science is, is done. And, there, and you missed the point. Of, I, mean, I wasn't criticizing your scientific credentials. You're an endocrinologist. You're an MD. You're not a, a theoretical physicist. That, that, I mean, the, the way science is done is I when, when, when theoretical a, physicists in this audience to actually address these oh, questions. Okay, so a theoretical physicist will be co will be comfortable talking with with real confidence in a very narrow band of his expertise, and he will be exquisitely sensitive to the fact that when he's in a room like this, or she. Or she, sorry. Um, I'll just proceed with he just for simplicity's sake here. Um, he will be ex exquisitely sensitive to the fact that whenever he opens his mouth in a room like this, he is guaranteed to be speaking in front of half a dozen people who know more on any given issue than he does. The, the great irony of, of the popular conception of sci science as arrogant is that when you go to a scientific meeting, you, you, don't, you don't see arrogance. I mean, you're, you're about as likely to see real arrogance as you're likely to see nudity at a scientific conference. I mean, this is, this is people are constantly uh, offering caveats and hedges toward what they say. They, 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 every, every statement is couched in, I'm sure there's someone in the room who knows more about this than me, but because everyone is desperate to avoid public embarrassment. Now, this seems to be something you're not uh, doing. <laughs> if, I, if, I was worried, if I was worried about being embarrass, embarrassed, I wouldn't be actually influencing the people that I'm influencing. And, uh, and I can also say something right now is that I agree that, you know, science is about a very specific methodology. But for people like Michael, not you so much, but people like Michael, to take all of inner experience, all of the rich inner experience, and try to ex codify it in a graph with data is absurd. As opposed to what? Just calling it fuzzy words? How does that help us understand That's such it? an out, no, Michael. No. That's and, such an out. And one, Say, and one technical. Use the words fuzzy. All right. Use the words woo-woo, and you're out okay, of the I'll argument. Okay, I'll give you a technical. I'll give you a technical explanation. When you talk about, when you talk about the observer effect and the uncertainty principle, this is uh, how subatomic particles are altered by looking at them, by bombarding them with light, for example, because they're so small. And so you look at it or you don't look at it, and that changes the nature of what you're looking at. But the moon is really there whether you look at it or not. It doesn't apply to the macro world. In the absence of a conscious entity, the moon remains a radically ambiguous and ceaselessly flowing quantum suit. Deepak, that is... That, that you have to have a conscious being. The moon? Well, well, yes. Okay, listen to the sounds in the room. Okay, wait, let, 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 uh, I want to hear the sounds of Gene. <laughs> because... You know, I'm listening as a, excuse me, I'm listening as a woman. And as a woman, I'm getting a somewhat different perspective on this, you know, because one of the things we're talking about, the, 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 does God have a future? Well, one of the reason, things is you look at who is really uh, addressing this. Uh, the world is changing. This is the most interesting time in human history. I realize other times thought they were it, they're wrong. This is it, you know, this is... <laughs> This is the time in which, <laughs> you know, what we do in our lifetime could profoundly make a difference as to whether we grow or die, or whether the 13.7 billion year experiment that has resulted in our sitting on this stage could be over within this next century. There are factors that are unique in human history happening now. One of them, I believe, and that really address this question, one of them has to do with the rise of women, slowly but surely, with a whole lot of backlash, to full partnership with men in the whole domain of human affairs. Now, being a woman, I would have to say that part of that mindset, and I find this with women all over the world, is an emphasis more on process rather than on product, on making things cohere, develop, and grow. The very fact that the world mind is taking a walk with itself, that we're receiving not just the harvest of many different scientific points of view, 
but also the wisdom traditions that you, you have studied so deeply, Sam, the wisdom traditions and the spiritual meta-technologies and processes of many different cultures and, uh, and states of mind. But Gene, I would, I'm sorry, and I apologize for interrupting you, but I would be fascinated to hear where you stand on, on the, the fight that the, the men have been having here about, uh, <laughs> about uh, whether you can muster any convincing proof or evidence to support the contention that there is an intelligence at the heart of the universe or something more than this. You are the proof. What does that mean? I think <laughs> even Michael is the proof. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think about that? Well, you see, I, I come from a very different perspective. My, my perspective is as is philosophical, as well as being an activist in uh, social change. My work is human development in the light of social change. If this kind of, of, of uh, conversation can lead to a deepening of our understanding of our human condi condition, and then that, that deepening can bring forth greater em radical empathy, love, understanding, so that we don't have, you know, the apocalypse of different cultures really killing each other, as you've written about so beautifully, then I think that we're going somewhere. Ultimately, I, I think that God has a future. I'm not sure of the human race, you know, having this future. What so is the my, future of God, in your opinion? And, and I, is it a constructive oh my. future? I think, well, from what I'm seeing, I think we are moving personally toward a planetary civilization with high individuation of culture, in which I would hope that the spiritual sensibility, which I find in people literally all over the world, could prevail over a particular archaic religiosity, and that that would be part of the future of God. So, Michael, you have been... Um, let's just say dismissive of, of what um, uh, Deepak has said thus, thus far about the notion that there is something more than this. Mm -hmm. uh, how can you be so sure that there isn't? And I know it's hard to prove a negative, yeah. um, if not impossible. But, but what, give me some evidence to, to support your contention that this is it. Well, for example, well, I, I can't prove that there isn't something else that I don't know that there, that there isn't. Huh? I mean, it's like the difference between something invisible and something non-existent. Well, it's zero and we can't study it. But if you take something specific like Gene's uh, excellent comment there, uh, we actually have a pretty good scientific understanding now based on evolutionary theory and evolutionary psychology that if you expand the circle of sentiments to include other people as honorary members of your tribe, you're less likely to kill them. And so, like, for example, tried and true game theory kind of data in the real world of opening up economic borders, you're less likely to bomb countries that make your cars and computers. That's a form of trade that makes, makes you feel like uh, somebody else is an honorary member of your tribe. Well, that has very deep evolutionary reasons that we've now come to understand in just the last few decades by applying the methods of science to something with a real social consequences. Uh, and we can derive that from data and tests and game theory models and, and so forth. So uh, it, just in terms of what we can operationally define carefully so that we're all talking about the same thing and then go measure it or test it or experiment with it or try it. I mean, one of the great things about uh, democracy, liberal democracy, it's kind of a scientific experiment. Let's, let's try this, let's try that. This state has th this taxation system, this one has that taxation system. Let's, it's like an experiment. And so I think the, um, what you described, Gene, as the uh, expanding circle of sentiments to include women is a result of the Enlightenment uh, experiment that let's try that. Let's see if that produces a greater prosperity and wealth and happiness and joy for more people in more places, and it worked. And that's a, that's a, that's a rational, reasonable approach. Well, one thing I'd like to add to that is I think it's ironic to mention, to score women's rights for... for your side of the ledger here in this conversation because there's been no greater obstacle to empowering women in human history than religion. Certainly the three monotheists. I mean, what, when you... Sam, but Sam. To, to my ear, at least, neither Gene nor Deepak is advocating religion as, it's, uh, as you well, well, that's, understand. That, that's true, and, and that's... That's why I, I, I said what I said at the beginning. That the, the issue here is, I mean, what kind of conversation should we have and how will this conversation be construed 
by, by people in the audience, by people seeing this on television. And, yeah, and but the, I, the, the I would, reality I is, is that, that the, the kind of talk and the kind of in, invocations of science that, that, that Deepak is offering here is received by a great number of people who believe a lot of unjustified, very myth-laden stuff uh, that has been handed down to us. You're making Holy that Coast. statement without qualifying okay. it, or, without giving any proof of it. Give uh, me no. some proof that what I'm saying is what he says is woo woo, just because he can't understand it. Okay. The, you know, every every discipline has its vocabulary. It's, it's okay. If you're going to say that that non-locality is, is is an operable principle in neuroscience. That is woo-woo right now it's in not. neuroscience. It's that, a that is their... principle in morphogenesis and differentiation. It's a principle in the workings of the pacemaker of your heart, where a hundred pacemaker not, cells it's fire not simultaneously, non-locally. A, a saying it louder and, and relentlessly is not going to make it true. <laughs> um, but I, I, want, I want to get back, to, to answer your question, Dan, I, I want to get back to, to something that actually matters. The, the people, 90% the, the, of the people watching this on television will never have heard of non-locality, and, and if, if we could explain it to them, they're not going to care about it. They're, they're worried about Jesus. They're worried about the collision with the Muslim world. Uh, they're worried about, about uh, gay marriage. I mean, this, this, is, this is religion talk, and we're talking about the future of God. Now, That's if, the past of God. If, right? Okay, so the, I'm happy to move on from that, but, but let's, let's first acknowledge that that's the context. That's why we're having this conversation. The reason why we're talking about God is for the last 4,000 years, people have been handing books to their children saying, all these other books were written by people, but this book is a magic book. It could not possibly have been written by a human being. Well, I think, and, and, and so now we're here talking about God and the future of God. You think that's the past of God? And what is no, the, I, what is I the think future? we can comfortably say that what Sam is talking about, one reason we're having this conversation is, that this conversation will lead to other conversations which can say, been there, done that. Let's move on. And the future of God is to understand how a new understanding of science, a new understanding of the perennial wisdom traditions, otherwise called woo-woo, actually can lead to more compassion, to more love, to more kindness, to more tolerance, to more peace to more insight, to more inspiration, to more creativity. So we become the conscious beings through which the universe will take its le next leap in evolution. That's the future. What's that, what sounds so bad about that future? Well, but uh, all of that is good. You should be doing those things anyway, whether or not there's a God or a great spirit or a non-locality. <laughs> you know, and related to that, and, and, and that's a, you know, a very good point, point but the, what we find is that I tends to, I attends, tends to tend to thou more than I attends to it. And it's just, it's that whole question of having that personal I-thou relationship. I once studied with Martin Buber, who was, a, by, by the way, this tall and his beard was that long. And uh, he, you know, he, he talked about this sense of personal relationship being dynamic in the, in the spiritual experience. Now, at the same time, what we find, it's fascinating, we are living in the time in which we sit, zazen, we, uh, you know, we, we flirt with uh, uh, Sufism and Buddhism and its many, many different ideologies. And is this cafeteria religion or is it people finding in the great repast of spiritual knowings, the wisdom traditions of many places, finding their own place, slowly but surely, in their own spiritual life. Okay, but Jean, Jean, so th that scheme, I, I, agree, I agree with you about that scheme. There are many people having these remarkable experiences in every traditional context. That in and of itself proves that all of these religions are wrong. Oh, all, all how of these, is that? All of these religions <laughs> claim very funny. their exclusive validity. And the fact that you have Christians having deep experiences of peace, and you have Muslims, and you have atheists, and you have Buddhists, it proves that there's a deeper principle that should be talked about in a non-sectarian way that is not held hostage by Iron Age, age literature. I mean, that... Okay, so... so well, we, no, we no, 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 that's a very important point. We and need I a think scientific I... discourse on the possibilities of human well-being. Sure. And, and, 
And you can get as, as, as esoteric as you want there. You can talk about self-transcendence. You can talk about the ego being an illusion. You can ask, what is the relationship between consciousness and the rest of the physical world? And the truth is, when you get out to some of those fringe areas, you are getting to an area of real scientific ignorance. Uh, and the first thing you want to do in the spirit of intellectual honesty is admit ignorance, not claim that you, by closing your eyes, can realize your identity with the entire cosmos and, and you, the origin of the, uh, you go get before the Big Bang with your, your, your unguarded intuitions. I mean, that's just not, that's not how you discover what happens. And it's also who you and I have been talking to, you know, who will give very different perspectives on this. I think the, the big issue here in the future of God is that the reset button of history has been hit and that we are in times such as we have never had before. And that in such times, I, I am finding people moving to a sense of radical empathy, not just with others' sensibilities and points of view, without which we will perish. You see, and you take a very different point of view. But that we are also, I think, expanding our sensibility of what we have called transcendence, grace, love, compassion. And as we do this, I think that there is being created in the world and time today a very unique and emergent spirituality and with it a new story. I mean, that's what I have to hold to in the work that I do around the world, that there's a new story. I mean, let's take myth, myth, for example. Now, I use myth different, differently than superstition. I think that a myth is something that never was, but is always happening. It's almost like the coded DNA of the human mind-brain system. And I travel to countries where I see the stories changing. As for example, I was in India and uh, they were showing that great, great, the Ramayana about, uh, you know, it's the great core story of India. And as we watched, the people came in, they tied up their water buffalo, they sat down, and here was the story of Rama and Sita and Sita being rescued. And the old Brahmin lady sitting next to me, she said, oh, I don't like Princess Sita, she's much too passive. We women in India were much stronger than that. We have to change the story. And I said, Madam, the story is at least 3,000 years old. She said, all the more reason why we have to change it. My name, is, my name is Sita. My husband's name is Rama. He's a lazy bun. Anything happened, I'd have to rescue him. And I was watching the changing of the story in its mythic structure. The story is moving, I believe, from my experience around the world. I think it's moving to men and women together as part of the heroic journey. I think it's moving to people in many, many different cultures. And it is about the saving, if you will, of this beautiful planet in this its most critical moment in human history. And that's the new story. Jean, you, you know that, that, that nowhere in human discourse is there a greater impediment to changing the story than in religion. I mean, the, the story doesn't change. The Ramayana is not going to get rewritten based You're on You're talking that about cultural mythology, not religion. I, I'm talking, not the I, religious I'm talking experience. about the Bible, the Quran. That's all, all cultural the mythology. The, the organizing doctrines by which 99% of the people on earth who call themselves religious still are, the past. Are still the past. Life. We have the internet. We have ABC News. We can change that conversation. Yeah, I, that, that, that is the purpose of conversations like this. But it seems to me that if, you're, the moment you, if you want to move forward and reinvent God and actually have it be relevant to people, and have your word God, I mean, I don't know why you'd be tempted to use the word God. If in Generation fact you don't, you organization don't be, delivery. Please. <laughs> Uh, you're, you're, it seems to me that you are, you are uh, happily being misunderstood in your use of the word God. Uh, you know that, Actually sad. That, va that vast numbers of people care about God for a multiplicity of reasons, mo most of which you don't want to defend on this stage. But why use the word God? Why not just talk about I just told you it's an acronym. No. Deepak. Well, <laughs> well you know, I have to say... Sorry for being so combative. That was because of Michael Shermer, but I actually agree. <laughs> I, actually, I actually agree with almost everything you've said, Sam. I have no disagreement with the deeper truth that you are hinting at. I am just saying is that this conversation needs to take place in a setting such as this, where it can lead to other conversations so that this is not a debate by a dialectic where through these contradictory points of view we arrive at a greater truth. Okay. But, but, you, you are carrying around a tremendous amount of ballast from the past 
and you, and you are t describing it as somehow necessary equipment. So for instance, you talked about these great wisdom traditions that, that he is so callously dismissed out of his own ignorance. You go to these great wisdom Thank traditions, you. right? <laughs> And you can so I mean so the, and you're talking about changing the story and, and so what does it mean to change the story in Islam? Let's just talk about facts. You open the Quran. In the fourth chapter, it says disobedient wives should be whipped by their husbands. Okay, so this is what this it is, says that in the Old Testament, all kinds I, of things. I, I, it says it that absolutely in does. the I'm, Hindu I'm, book I'm, of I'm just, uh, Deepak. I'm just picking Islam as an example. If, why? It's true of all religions. Okay, then I can pick Judaism. Would it would you be more comfortable if I picked Judaism as an example? It's the same. Yes, all of these books are are, are litanies of barbarous practices, but the the point is that what is the, the way Muslims are now constrained to change the story is they have to, they can't change the Quran. The Quran is the perfect word of the creator of the universe. They have to parse the word whipped, and the most enlightened of them have to say things like, well, it doesn't actually mean you take out the bull whip and you whip her. It could be a kind of a ceremonial kind of uh, padding. <laughs> you know, just a, chast a brief chastisement that doesn't actually hurt. And so you get a range, but nowhere in that range do you get real equity and real compassion and real understanding between the sexes. And that's, to get that, you have to admit, okay, this is barbarous nonsense that we, we should just disregard. And, and religion doesn't give you the tools to do that. And God talk doesn't, is either profoundly misleading or unhelpful, or it's just part of the problem. So in, to your mind, to your minds, is there any future of God that you could be comfortable with? Um, a God, say, defined the way Deepak defines it. Well, it's, I mean, so he's sort of redefining it in his own particular way, in which everybody would have to agree. And then, I guess my point is, why hinge it to all the, the well, the woo-woo stuff? Why hinge it to things that are just fuzzy words? We can actually get right down to understanding what's going on with things like compassion science, and emotion. Science does and not explain why we're here. It doesn't answer a lot of the big questions. Oh, okay, but that doesn't mean it. It doesn't mean that we can't at least try to understand. I mean, the whole point of science is to try to get down and drill in and figure out what's going on. So we can use words like "it'd be better if we were all compassionate and loving to one another" and so on. Of course, who would disagree? But what we want to know as scientists is, well, how do you actually implement that? What, what are the sorts of things we can do? that increase that in people. Well, we have to understand what's going on when somebody has affections for somebody else. So, for example, uh, if you have an exchange with a, another human, a stranger, in which you give them something and they give you something back and it's a positive thing, there's a little spike in oxytocin. Oxytocin is an attachment hormone uh, discovered with nursing mothers and then expanded to it. Looks, it turns out anytime you touch somebody else, there's a little oxytocin there. So anything we can do to increase oxytocin is a good thing, and that makes people like each other. So there, I've not taken anything away from the beauty of love and the emotional appreciation, but we now have an understanding of the mechanics of it, and therefore you can structure some kind of social system in which there's more of that, not, not spraying it in the air, but, but actually having people exchange uh, things in a positive way, like trade, uh, makes, increases oxytocin, and there's nothing wrong with knowing that. It doesn't take anything away from the story. I'm not sure how I know this, I but I think Deepak to... wants to say yeah. something. <laughs> oxytocin is not love. Oxytocin is the measurement of love in a laboratory. No. Just like You're H2O, no, no. knowing the formula H2O is not the experience of water. Deepak, okay. this experiment so, has been run. I know it has been no, run. I, what does it prove, the though? The control is that you give oxytocin to people, and then they become Because both oxytocin and the, the experience of, of love are interdependent. Th this is semantic. It's not a cause, yeah. causal relationship. It, it is is not the same it thing as cause. correlation. Deepak, there, there, there are different levels if of If I go to a picnic ourselves. and there are ants all the time, that doesn't mean ants cause the picnic. Okay, let me just explain the experiment. <laughs> so... Two people in a game. Center. I know the experiment, yeah, but Michael. Wait, wait, I have to say it. Two people. This is the kind of woo woo you guys promote no, 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 to no. prove is, your yeah, so-called science. I don't know the experiment. A, a little experiment. Experiment. Yeah, let me. T okay. T okay. So, you you have two people in an exchange game, and they make an offer to each other. And if it's fairly equitable and generous, they feel good about each other. You draw their blood, and there's a spike in oxytocin. Now, is that because? Oxytocin is the result of the positive interaction, or is it the cause? So the control was you give them a little, before the experiment, you give them a little hit of oxytocin with nose spray. It's done to induce labor in pregnant women. 
And Paul Zach did this research, and sure enough, any subjects that got a, a spike got a spike in oxytocin from the nose spray were more generous than those that didn't get the spike. But it if I cause, if I that. said I love you and it meant something to you, you would also release oxytocin. Yeah. So does the thought create the molecule, or the molecule create the thought? Are are they simultaneous expressions of a deeper transcendent reality that we are inseparable? Ask him. Can, can, I, can I just jump in here? Uh, okay, well, you, I think we should wander off the, the, uh, the specifics of oxytocin. You, 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 he's just described an experiment where you can actually answer that question. If I give you a shot of oxytocin and it changes your level of trust, then, the, then the, it's not just mere correlation. I mean, we've run, the, we've run it both ways. So but that's I what can he just increase described. trust and it can generate yeah, oxytocin yes, okay. too. But, but if trust is just the brain in one state, then you have the brain influencing its future states. You haven't gotten out of the brain and gotten an, an, an ectoplasm. Trust or a, or is a, the subjective experience soul. of consciousness. Oxytocin is the objective experience yes, okay, of consciousness. Yes, okay, but what you seem to be expressing is a deeper skepticism about whether the brain is even involved. No, the brain uh, is involved. No, your consciousness likes brains to express itself. Okay, but do you believe, for instance, that I mean, do you believe that, that, that does, do we have souls or some, that our mind is somehow independent of the brain that will lift off the brain at death and go elsewhere? Is that I believe the there's a transcendent proposal? core consciousness that is comprised of meanings, context, relationships, archetypal ideas that recycles itself, just like everything else recycles okay. so itself. So it's, it's in no sense a product of the brain? It's, uh, it's no sense a product of the brain, and our whole endeavor in spiritual discipline is to actually go beyond that personal consciousness, that ego consciousness, so we can identify with that transcendent reality, which is the source of space, time, energy, and everything else that exists. Okay, well, let me just say no, a few things. No, but I think the question is, are we, uh, are we encapsulated bags of skin dragging around a dreary little ego? No, no, or that, are that, that we is, organism really environment the symbiotic you, you with fields no and consciousness See, of life? That, the, the, Deepak, let me just say, you put a lot on the table. You act, so Deepak just said some very, uh, seems a strange word to use, but some concrete things that, that, that science can criticize. Okay, the, the, you just said that consciousness and mind are... I didn't say consciousness and mind. I no, said no. mind is a product of consciousness. Okay, but what okay? this, this, this subjectivity is independent of the objectivity of the brain. There is a subjectivity which is independent of objects. But there's a subjectivity yes, okay. which is subjectivity of itself. When you're looking at the brain for consciousness, you're not looking at consciousness. You're looking at synaptic firings. In fact, yes, it is your yes, consciousness yes. that is looking okay. at those synaptic okay. firings. All right. Let's just, Where? Let's, just Where? Keep, let's just keep that in view. All right. Now, you've said that there are two things that, that an incomplete science of consciousness and the mind should want to say about that. One is that, that having an experience of undivided consciousness is, does not tell you what consciousness really is or what its relationship to the brain really is. There's nothing about introspection that leads you to sense that your subjectivity is at all dependent or even related to voltage changes and chemical interactions going on inside your head. Okay, you can, you can feel, you can drop acid, you can meditate for a year, you can do whatever you want to perturb your nervous system. You can, you can feel yourself to be one with the universe, and at no point in that transformation do you get a glimpse that there's a hundred trillion neurons in your head, uh, or synapses in your head, that, that are doing anything. It's called okay? binding. No, it's not. It's called. It's called absolute subjective ignorance of the of, of what's actually going on outside the consciousness. You're okay. so, so, but, so. You're so deep. But let, you're so dismissive. Not, no, no. Dismissive of subjective experience. I'm not. I'm which not has remotely given rise dismissive to of poetry, it. to music, to art. So dismissive of subjectivity. I'm saying that the Deepak, whole universe I'm not, is imbued with subjectivity. There's nothing more important than subjectivity. It's all Thank we you. could possibly care about. The, the, the fabric of our experience, of our, the changes in our conscious experience are all we care about. Um, and they, they have some relation 
to the physical universe. Absolutely. Okay, now the question is... We give is, rise to the physical universe. Well, okay, that is a statement of metaphysics that is totally unjustified and cannot possibly be That's justified... That's why it's a statement based, of metaphysics, not of physics. On, no, no. Metaphysical statements also have to be justified, as it turns out. <laughs> Metaphysic uh, statements come from subjective experiences. All right, you're starting to lose me a little bit. <laughs> I've let it go. I've let it go, but let's rein it back in. I, I just want to just curious with you, Tony. I tried to go down this road with you before, but, but you didn't really bite, so I'm going to try it again. Um, are, are you, I think the question that a lot of people have for guys like you, atheist agnostic, is are you comfortable with not, you're, you must be therefore comfortable with not knowing the answers to big questions, or um, you have some sort of confidence that there is nothing more that most other people don't have? Well, twofold. One, uh, yes, as a, by temperament, I'm comfortable not knowing the big answers to the big questions. It's okay to say, I don't know, and just live with it. Believe it or not, it, that's okay. And. And, 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 you, and, you believe, and you believe that when, when Deepak comes up with theories that you would call woo-woo, that he is just simply at his core, whether he knows it or not, uncomfortable not knowing? Well, I'm not sure about that. I think he likes to layer on the uh, language of science because it, 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 it seems to ground it in something a little more concrete than just woo. And, and what we're saying here is that you don't need to do that. You don't need to hinge it to all this jargon. Because values like, like love and tolerance for differences and expanding the circle of sentiments to include more people, those are values that stand in and of themselves because people have value as an end in themselves, not as a means to an end. And that's an enlightenment value that's derived from scientific and reason and rational principles for the last 500 years. And you don't have to take all of that layer and, and, and put it on there that most people wouldn't understand anyway, and it just confuses things. Is your rock-solid certitude about there not being a God uh, in and of itself a form of orthodoxy? Well, I'm not rock-solid that there is no God. I would be surprised at this point, I have to say. Uh, if, if it was anything like uh, uh, Yahweh, I, I'd be shocked. But I actually have a little thing I would say, if it turned out to be the case, what I would say standing there at the, at the pearly gates. <laughs> All right, what is it? Uh, Oh, well, um, I mean, first of all, it would be, uh, you, know, you, you gave me this brain uh, in your own image to that uh, it reasons and doubts and so on, and so I applied it to you. And, uh, and, and so, in any case, why does belief matter? Shouldn't it matter more how you comport yourself in life and how you treat other people? And I'll, but, 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 yeah. but, 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 Deepak, and I'll get to you in just one second, but Deepak's point is that... Uh, that you know, you, mo molecules don't feel compassion. That, right. that, 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 uh, that ethics and love and compassion and empathy are all, can you tell me if I'm wrong here, evidence that can be marshaled in support of it an argument. It is impossible, it is impossible, and Roger Penrose and John Searle would substantiate this. It is impossible for a physical system, no matter how complex it is, to process meaning, to process uh, uh, creativity to process purpose, to process even, you can map it out, you can show the molecules there, but it is impossible for a physical system to feel those qualities. Okay, that, that's, that's okay. simply not true. It, it's what is tr true to say is that we don't understand how that is being accomplished, and we don't, and even, I'll give you even more than that, we don't understand what the relationship between consciousness and matter is. Now, if, for instance, if, if electrons I'll were grant conscious, you that, by the way, what you just yeah. corrected me on. So, it, it, so it's, but it's not, there's no reason, it gets you nothing to say it's Im impossible in science. Well, I'm I mean, just let's, let's, saying let's just, that, you know, very prominent researchers like John Searle and Roger Penrose have made those explicit statements. Okay, but they're, they're in, a, in, in a much larger conversation. They have, have more detractors that could, than could fit in this hall. Um, this, is, this is a... These are, these are areas of genuine scientific uncertainty, but what is, what is obvious is that the way to clarify